In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make these wooden parts, which are part of um, the design for Pella Proline windows. Um, if, if anyone has these windows, they know that they're problematic for a couple of reasons and they lead to premature rotting. So I'm actually making this for someone who asked me to make some for them, but the lumber he wants them made out of, I can't find by where I live. And my schedule is really busy at the time, so I don't have time to do it. So I thought I could make an instructional video to help him through the process. So the circled part is the, the piece I'm talking about making. He has these windows and they are rotted. Like I said, Pella, it's a bad design. There was actually a class action lawsuit against them. Some people got reimbursed for the material, some people haven't, but he's trying to save the glass and the aluminum cladding so um, it's, it's much cheaper if you could make these frames yourself. I'm going to start this project with a Douglas fir 2x4. Like I said, I'm just showing, this is an instructional video that it's easier to upload on my YouTube because it's 20 minutes long. He's going to use it to try and make them. If he can't do it, he's looking for someone in the Richmond, Virginia area to make these for him. Um, if you live in that area and this looks like something you think you can do, email me. I'll put my email in the description and I can get you in touch with him. So I just cut these down into want foot sections. I had made samples of these for him before and mailed them to him, but he wasn't able to find anyone that could recreate them. So this is Douglas fir, which is a decently rated exterior wood, but if I was making these for my own home, I would probably not use this. I would use these if I was planning on thoroughly priming them and painting them before installing them. They would last much longer that way. So he sent me these dimensions, which I was actually going to link in the description, but he has since told me that some of the measurements are off, so I'm not going to do that. The basic design is the same. Um, if you do want to make these, what I'm going to recommend is if Pella doesn't have dimensions like that, just take your windows out, make a cross section of the piece, and then build it the exact same way I'm doing it. It would have been easier to probably work off an actual piece of the frame because you can hold it in, in, in three dimension versus flat on the table, but it's the exact same process. So I'm pointing out that the measurements are all in, in decimals and they don't equal um, standard standard measurements and they don't equal um, uh, metric measurements. So that was why I showed the conversion chart. But like I said, since these dimensions are wrong, I actually just found that out, I think yesterday, um, that really isn't as important as I thought it was going to be for this video, pointing out that the you have to convert some of these decimals. But basically, like I said, I'm using this Douglas for two by four. It was really straight, so I didn't plane it or joint it. Um, I know the person who wants to try and recreate these does not have a lot of tools, so I really spent a lot of time trying to make this with just the table saw. There are easier ways and different ways to make a lot of these cuts, but like I said, I didn't want to have one of those videos where you needed five different tools with five different jigs in order to make it. So this is all done on the table saw, so keep that in mind. So like I said, I just cut this out to my rough dimension. It was obviously has to be a certain height and a certain width, and that's what I started with. So I made this those dimensions, and then the first cut I'm gonna make is it's basically a large rabbit. So I mark all of these measurements off the diagram. I could take them to the table saw. I could get my blade at the right height, and then I could send all of my pieces through. So the way I'm making this rabbit is I'm gonna make two curved cuts where the curve cuts meets, that extra piece of wood will, will come out. If you have a dado stack for your table saw, you can make this cut with a dado stack, but you could also do it the way I'm doing it with a regular saw blade. So we're on to the second cut. You can see a lot of times I was transferring my, my marks to other sides of the woods just to make a safer cut. You really want as much material touching the fence as well as touching the table saw as possible to keep these cuts as safe as possible. Some of them get a little hairy is not really the way I want to I want to word it, but they get to the point where you really have to pay attention to what you're doing because if they shift on you, you'll have some problems. 
and that is what that cut looks like as I go. I'm working off of the drawings, like I said, so I'm making sure everything lines up. If you are doing this, you can work off of a cross section of this panel, and um, it's the exact same, same process. So you can see, since I didn't joint or plane this, even though this lumber is pretty square, I'm going to have a little bit of undulation in it for the purposes of this sort of frame, that this is not going to be a huge deal. If you want to go through and plane that flat, that's fine. But like I said, it, it's not really necessary. So there's this groove um, that that is at the bottom of this rabbit. So I'm going to cut that in a series of curves. And if you remember from the original drawing, basically some silicone is supposed to go in here and then the, the glass will fit in this groove. So that's kind of its purpose in, in, in the actual window. So you can see I'm showing how it kind of teeter totters off of the fence. But if I switch this around, I now have two contact points between the fence and the table saw. So while this looks like a little bit of a scarier cut, I actually personally find it to be a little safer. I've already uploaded a couple shorts of this process and people were pointing out um, these cuts, but my fingers aren't near the saw. The saw's not going all the way through the wood. And like I said, because I have that feather board in place, which is really important, you'll notice I use the feather board for all of these cuts. And I have a solid connection with the table saw um, top as well as the fence. It's, it's, it's a pretty easy cut. I also remember to switch out and put my zero clearance plate in along the way, which also makes it um, safer. So I cut the one side of that kerf and then I cut all the way to the other side. Whenever I'm making a cut like that, I like to cut my two edges because then you can just kind of send pieces through a little more casually in the middle and remove all of the excess material. So the reason I'm making so many blanks is if you're making this in real, real life in your own shop, there are a lot of cuts in this. There's a lot of chances to make mistakes. So if I was making this for someone, I'd be making all of these shorter pieces, testing out all my cuts on them. If you mess one up, you could kind of toss it aside and I still had a nice stack to work with. That's why I have all these. My goal was to, to make a one by one square frame to make sure that all of my setup was accurate enough to actually recreate a smaller version of this window. So as you saw, I just like I used, I think it was four curse, ended up removing all of this material. Um, there was a little bit of, of raised material left. So I went through very quickly with a chisel and just cleaned up the bottom of that joint. But like I said, this is gonna be getting silicone and glass. So if that bottom's not perfectly flat, it should not affect um, the build. The build. So then for, for the rest of this, I have a couple groove cuts to make, and then there's angled cuts on the drawings. These are not on the same plane, which means I can't cut them um, by flipping over the piece. They're also not the th same th uh, thicknesses. So this one on this one side is actually a little bit more than a 16th of an inch. So in real life, if this groove is this dimension, you'd have to go get a thin kerf blade. When I originally made a sample um, for this guy, it was almost last summer at this point, I asked him if it mattered if those grooves were super accurate. And he said no, because there's aluminum cladding going in there and he could just um, put some extra silicone in there. So I'm cutting both of these with my table saw blade because I don't have a thin curve blade in the shop. My saw blade you could see is a little under an eighth. So it's going to work perfectly for the cut on one side. It's going to be a little big for the cut on the other. But like I said, he said he didn't think that it would matter. If you are making these, I, that is, I'm pointing out the fact that if you, if you want it to be as accurate as possible, and like I said, these dimensions are off, so I don't know if that cut is actually as, as thin as it shows, um, you'll have to get a thin, a thin kerf blade. So all I did was set up that first cut, their little grooves. So you could see I measured everything like I showed. I measured them off the dimensions. I raised the blade and, and sent it through. So that is that cut. Once again, I know that looked a little dangerous, but I still had the connection point between the fence 
and the table and um, that is what what makes it a little bit easier having those two contact points it's not really cantilevering because it can catch itself on the fence and then for the cut on the other side much simpler because it could sit flat um, same process you saw me move the fence i could send that through and get that cut so for these top angles here on the drawing they're two different um, angles and it's we're working with small material here so it's kind of hard to get those accurate i just extended the lines off of the drawing i lined it up with the piece i made those marks and i could use my bevel gauge to then transfer that angle to the table saw the first time i did this it was a little off which was fine because it was it was a smaller angle i cut as long as it's off in the direction where it's smaller you can make the angle larger i think i had it set up for 40 degrees it's actually 45 so i could just recut that first sample so i had to switch back out to the wider um, plate in here because this is an angled cut this is just a 45 degree you can see there's not a lot of material touching the the table but it is a very small cut and with the feather board i was able to slide that through with without being too nervous about it on the other side, this is a 35 degree angle. So I set all that up the same. I move the fence over to, to line up with my marks. I'm not really using a tape measure for a lot of this. I'm marking the wood. I'm lining the marks on the wood up with where the table saw blade is gonna hit it. And then I'm making the cuts. This one, you can see there is there is a, li a little bit of material touching the table. But this is one of those cuts where as soon as my the piece cleared the blade, I moved my hand to hold it secure against the fence. As long as you are keeping this secure against the fence, it's not going to catch on you. It's when you kind of let stuff flop off the fence where you start having problems. So you can see even though it blocked the camera angle on that cut, as soon as I, it cleared the blade and the feather board was only holding that tail end piece in, I moved my hand and finished it through, through the cut past the blade. And then the last cut on this is that front angle. This was pretty easy. It was a 10 degree angle. I could once again just put the mark on the front, line it up with the saw, set the blade to 10 degrees, and send it through. So these are all the blanks I'm working with because the part that was going to be more difficult, which is these mortise and tenons, I did this the next day. The reason these are a little bit of a pain is you now have an odd shaped piece of lumber. This was one of the original samples I, I sent him last summer. It's not as accurate as the ones I made because I made these pretty quickly. They're not um, um, centered. So that means you can't just, if you're making like a door per se and you're making a mortise and tenon, a lot of times it's gonna be centered, um, a centered joint. So you just flip the piece and, and cut identically. These aren't. So you're gonna have to have four setups to cut. So two setups to cut this mortise and then two setups to cut the tenon. So same process, I, I put the measurements on there. I'm doing this on my cross cut sled for my table saw because like I said, I wanted to use one tool. Most people have a cross cut sled and if they don't, they're very easy to make. It's essentially just a piece of wood attached to two runners squared to, to the blade and then it has just a perpendicular fence to hold pieces against. Something like this you can make out of scrap quite easily. So I just have two pieces of ply that are offset from each other so that you can see I could cut one edge of this mortise, I could cut the other edge of the mortise using the other piece of plywood as a fence, and then I could just move it between and cut all of the metal. Now you could see my fence, um, I put this piece on the back so I could hold it in place. Now obviously this is only a foot long, so in real life these are most likely gonna be for a window that's three or four feet, so it's gonna be standing up tall, which is more so where this, this bar across the back comes into play so that you can clamp it to that and keep everything square. Now you have this rabbit cut out of the front, so in order to flip this around and cut the other side without having to completely change the setup, I just made those little spacer scraps that I will double side tape in place when I cut the other side but as you can see this is pretty simple once you have this setup done I can cut one edge of that mortise move it over clamp it cut the other edge and then cut it all the material away in the middle now my cross cut sled you could see I used it to cut an angled cut at one point 
it was one of those things that kind of was like I knew it was going to bother me through projects after that because I now have quite a large piece of material missing from that cross cut sled so that was the other reason I had the clamp up top so that this couldn't um, slide into that groove but most people don't have that in there because they have not used their cross cut sled for angles and, and you won't have that issue. The other nice thing about this is I wanted to cut the tenons before I went through and cut all of my pieces just in case something was wrong so I can take that whole setup off of the table saw set up for the tenons and then when I have to go back and cut my mortises I can just take that whole jig plop it back on the table saw and cut my mortises. So for the tenons, same thing. You can see at this point, I'm still kind of using the drawings just to double check. If, you, if you're way off at this point, there's gonna be a problem, but all the marks for the tenons, I'm marking off of my mortise. That is because you can cut your tenons first, you can cut your mortises first. It doesn't really matter in this circumstance, but whichever one you cut first, the part you cut second has to fit the first part. There's no point in making these to fit the drawings if the mortises on your piece aren't the same as the drawings. So like I said, it's really important. The thickness marks I got for this tenon, I got off of the piece that already had the mortises in it. Now, like I said, I'd made these before, so I knew that this was the joint I had the most problems with. This was the one I was expecting to max up at least once, because once again, it is not centered, so I have to lower the blade in between all the cuts. And the bottom is angled at 10 degrees to fit the angle on the piece that we made yesterday, and the top is square. So there's a lot of places to mess up your setup on this one. So on these, I knew I wanted to cut the tenon a little too thick, which is actually good practice anyway and then I would shave down the tenon to be able to fit into the mortise. I didn't try and make this tenon a perfect perfect fit. I made it a little wide and you'll see I'm going to uh, shave it down to get that perfect fit. So like I said the, the, the piece that has to be removed on this bottom here I am removing it by just moving over my fence and um, lowering the blade and lining it up with my marks. Now in order to cut these, I'm using this miter sled, which um, about the cross, the miter, I use my miter gauge that came with the saw to cut those. And all I have is a stop on my fence. Now I have a little bit of a fancier one that attaches with a thumb, um, a, a, a star knob but you can just clamp up a piece of wood to your fence. And basically it just sets up the depth of the cut, but it's away from the blade so it doesn't bind. And then as you clear that stop, you can make your cut and then line all your pieces right up against that stop. You can see, like I said, it wasn't a perfect fit. It was too thick. I have this rasp, it's called a Shino rasp, Shinto or Shino, um, S-H-I-N-T-O, I'll double check that. Um, someone recommend getting that in the in the description of one of my videos quite a few months ago. They were on sale around Thanksgiving time for Black Tuesday. They're only like $20, $25, and it has become a tool I use all the time in the shop. They really are great. It's, it's kind of like a Japanese rasp or a Japanese file. So once I finished up that tenon, the only problem I have with these cuts where you can see the tenon is a little too short. So when I go through and cut the rest of the tenons, I actually just move all of my setup over by, it's less than a 16th of an inch, it's like a 32nd of an inch, and everything turned out perfect. Like I said, you can see I can move the fence out of the way and bring the mortise set up back. And at this point, that is the joint. If you are making these, that is the main process. Um, what I decided to do was film the whole thing from a couple different angles for people that are trying to build these themselves. You can see how when I flip this over, that piece of wood makes it a safer cut. Otherwise, it'd be rocking on that angle. And like I said, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because it's the exact same thing. I'm just cutting this on the other side but um, that is the basic process. I had made all those extra scraps. I ended up not needing them. I really was methodical with this process. I spent a lot of time making sure the fence was in the right spot, the blade was at the right height, so I didn't make a lot of mistakes. This isn't really a hard process, but it's very tedious. There's like six or seven cuts just to make the stock. Then there's multiple jigs and multiple cuts to make the mortise and tenons. And if you mess all that up, it's a lot of wasted lumber. 
So I do have a stack of material I ended up not using, which is fine. Um, but I was anticipating making some mistakes, especially on the mortise and tenons. And then, like I said, I, once those um, mortises were cut, I cut four of them. They all turned out perfect. I could switch back to making the tenons. You could see that stop I'm talking about, how I have the thumb screw attached to my fence, but you could just clamp a piece of wood to your fence in order to do that. And it sets everything at the right depth you want, but you can see it clear. it's clear of the table saw blade so nothing can bind. And I just moved it over that 30 seconds of an inch, like I said I was going to. And the nice thing about making the scrap, which I recommend doing if you want to make these windows, make the scrap first, is you can see I'm using the scrap to set up all of my cuts again. I'm not measuring or anything like that. I'm just using the scrap, which was accurate enough in order to, to set everything up. It makes it so much faster this, doing this the second time around. Those are the curves. Usually I can just snap those off because this is just Douglas fir. And then, like I said, I could go through and get everything to be a perfect fit. Now, this one, you have that same issue with the angled cut. You can see it wants to rock on you a little bit because there's not a lot of material touching the fence. Just made sure to really hold that one tight in place when I sent it through. And then there's the fit. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's almost pretty perfect on this one. Obviously, anyone who makes stuff for a living will always nitpick their work, but the, the fits on this one all turned out pretty, pretty good, and the jigs were all accurate because they were all the same. So this is a small version of that frame. You can see all of my corners look nice. All the grooves and everything line up. The nice thing about this is since they are through mortise and tenons, all your parts are gonna be the same dimensions. So my, my uh, foot by foot parts all turn out to be a foot by foot frame. I measured my diagonals to check for square. I also checked the inside with square. Everything um, was, was perfect on this one. So I hope this helps some people. I'm not really into to bashing other companies, but it is pretty crappy if you replace all of your windows, which costs a lot of money not only to buy but to install and then a lot of people because I did some research online a lot of people 10 years later these windows aren't working and then just for the end of this video I wanted to show you how to make the mortise on um, my drill press and that is because like I said the mortise setup I think is the one thing people might have a problem with if they need really tall windows you might get to a point where you're hitting your ceiling having the piece vertical so I just want to show people another easy way to make it which was on the drill press if you have a mortising machine that's going to be an extremely easy way to make it you could also make a jig that would be a little bit more time consuming for the router if you want to make this like I said there's more than one way to make these joints but I really tried to focus on you using one tool to make all of these sides, but you can see with the drill press cut that it turned out the exact same way as, as making it on the table saw. And all I did was I used a spade bit to remove the bulk of the material and then a chisel to finish it up.